to bring is your Medicare, or your Medicare card and a list of your prescriptions. And by the way, there's a lot of good screening that goes on there, and it's not just for seniors, it's for everyone. So take advantage of that and be there, okay? Wow, that's not much confidence for the new year, all right. Okay, I want you to take out your, um, yeah, your little outline here. And I want to answer this question for you. Are we there yet? No. So all of us, let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. <laughs> Not really. I've kind of wondered what, what you have thought when you looked at eight points. Oh my God, what have we gotten into? But I hope tonight that you will catch what's on my heart. And I believe what God has for our church. Hopefully, what you will hear in the next few minutes about our church will not only be a confirmation for you, but will expand your vision. Where the heart of our vision comes from, hopefully, is from the heart of God. That God has begun this wonderful work of redemption on the planet and has invited us, we his people, to participate with him. Friends, there is a battle going on for the hearts and the souls of people. This work of redemption has never been risk-free. I want you to understand those words. This work has never been risk-free. It's always had an environment within it that has been called upon for each one of us to exhibit some kind of adventure. When we look at the cost of redeeming people, Jesus and everyone who has ever followed him has paid a huge price to see people redeemed. Why is there such a high price? What's the deal here? I can tell you what the deal is here. There's no higher stakes game than what we are playing, and that is the eternity of people and where they will spend eternity. And friends, I just want to say this to you and run it across your thinking tonight. If you are here and something about you does not come alive when there's possibly two to three hundred people on a weekend that gathers here that's in that particular area of wondering where they're, they're going to spend eternity and something doesn't move you, something's wrong. Because that's what the whole ball game is about. There's no higher stakes game. So God is always going to place himself in the middle of the action redeeming people's lives. God looks for people who will risk their lives to be with him in the middle of this battle. You know, it's, it's no longer can we sit on the sidelines. God is calling us into a battle that he's in the middle of. When you look at the people of God that used, that he used in the Bible, they were always risk takers. They were always people that would adventure out with God. Now, friends, I don't think that there's anybody here that doesn't sit and wonder when God calls you to do something, is that really you, God, and wonder if you're not taking a risk? But the point of it is, is that all of us have been called to do that very thing. I mean, if you look at Abraham, Abraham was called to go to a country that he didn't even know existed. Leave everything, everything that was normal to him, and push on out into something that he didn't even know where he was going. I mean, if you want to look at Moses, Moses was asked to give up a, a comfortable life in the house of Pharaoh to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. When you look at David, David just happened to be upon the scene when, you know, the armies of Israel were fighting the Philistines and Goliath came out and then David shows up. And the rest of his life has always been put in the middle of the battle fighting the enemies of God. Elijah, what a guy. I love Elijah. You know, he stands in the middle of 450 prophets of Baal and challenges them. Well, if your God is really there, then let's see it. And he doesn't show up there, God. And he says, well, let me tell you about my God. And builds a great big offering there and calls fire down from heaven and laps up the whole offering. And then he says, chase those false prophets and kill them. <laughs> cool. I mean, talk about being in the middle of the action. But I am saying to you, now, now listen to this. The higher the risk, friends, the greater the satisfaction. Now, I am not talking about some stupid little thrill that you might be thinking of, but I am talking about this. 
that the more that we risk, the more satisfaction there is in the adventure when the rewards come in. Very interesting to contemplate about this. But I am saying this to you, that if you don't know, friends, listen to this. I really want your attention on this. This applies to everybody under the sound of my voice. Think about it. Take it home and put it in your heart and just meditate about this. If you don't risk it in the right way, you will risk it in the wrong way. And every one of us are built for risk. And God is saying, I want you to risk your life with me as I am in the process of redeeming man. Well, I have to tell you something about myself. I've always been a risk taker. I've always been a person that had to risk it, sometimes to my own detriment. Sometimes I feel the adrenaline rush coming and I'm going, this is not good. You shouldn't be thinking that way. And I, it's almost like I can't stop myself. Now, let me tell you honestly what comes on me sometimes when I pull into this place. I will pull in here sometimes on the morning and I'll think in my mind, my God, what have we done? <laughs> and as quick as I think that, friends, the other thought comes right behind it because this is just the kind of person I am. I couldn't have it any other way. I got to be where the action is. I've always been that type of a person. I got to be where the action is. If you want a church where the environment is safe, where there will be no risk taking, you're probably in the wrong church. If you want a church where you are guaranteed your favorite seat and parking place, you're probably in the wrong church. If you want a church where your brand of theology will be taught every week and just make you comfortable, you're probably in the wrong church. If you just want to meet people that are, who are just like you, who talk just like you and look just like you, you're probably in the wrong church. If you just want to have a little heaven's dust sprinkled on you for one hour on Sunday morning just to make sure that you make it to heaven, you're probably in the wrong church. I thought I was going to get a lot of laughs out of that, and I didn't get in. <laughs> but let, me, let me just share this with you. I was uh, talking with a friend of mine that I knew from the business world before I ever became a pastor this week. But I was in a situation where he was in our church, and he said, I want to ask you one question. I said, well, what's that? And he said, what's going on here? And I kind of looked at him and thought, well, I wonder how I'm going to answer this one. What do you mean what's going on here? He said, no. He said, I, I, I basically know who you are, so I know that that's not the answer. What's going on here? <laughs> and I, actually, you know what he was asking? Friends, hopefully you'll get a hold of this. You know what he was asking? Can I trust it? Can I trust what's going on here? There's a buzz about this in the community. He talks about it. He says, there's people that are talking about you, and I want to know what's going on. And here's my question to you. If you were able to give the vision of this church, could you do it in such a concise sort of way that you really could convey to other people where we're going, where we're headed? And friends, it is my hope that through this little talk tonight, most of us will gain a vision as to where God is taking us out of the values that he has put into us so that we might see a city redeemed by God. And that's what this church is all about. So if you have your little outlines, you want to follow along, our scripture verses tonight is this, Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Just, let's say it together. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Okay? Number one is this. Eight points. We're going to make it through on time, okay? So I had John, Ron uh, cut down the song. So, Ron, I got a lot of points. You just got to do this for me. <laughs> Number one, we are committed to be a church to the unchurch. These are the eight core values that guide Canyon View Vineyard Church. We are committed to be a church to the unchurch. There are just certain issues in a person's heart that will not go away. This last summer, Bill Hybels at our leadership summit talked and gave a message about things that just will not settle in people's hearts. Something inside of you that when you see an injustice going on in the world that you just go, I got to do something about that. Whether that's the poor, whether that's the hungry, whether that's people that are addicted to stuff, whether that's youth, whether that's children, whatever the case might be, 
you're finding out in your life there is something in you that just wrecks you. That just says, i got to do something. It won't leave your conscience. It won't leave your mind. It is just something that is upon you all the time. And it's just one of those things that you got to do something about. Well, guess what mine is, friends? Unchurched. It drives me nuts. And I'm not just saying something here to be, you know, to try and drum up some kind of emotion. I'm telling you, this drives me nuts. A hundred thousand people, over a hundred thousand people in our valley go to church nowhere. And we've got scores of people out there that need to hear the message of Jesus Christ. Here's a comment that I get lots of times from people. My dream job, they'll come to me and say this, my dream job is to work in the church. And I'll go, no! (laughs) It is not your dream job. And they'll kind of look at me like this, and I'll tell you exactly why, friends. We want you to make friends with all the people that are out there. We want you to know that they are, you know, unchurched people. Most of them are de-churched people. They've had an experience with church, and they don't want to come back to church. And as your pastor, I am asking you to make friends with those people. Put up with their dirty jokes. You know what I'm saying? Do you think Jesus ever had to listen to some dirty jokes? You know, overcome the bad habits that they have, the wrong lifestyles that are there, and just learn to love on them. And I'll guarantee you this, friends, that at some point, the whole message about why you are there is going to come up, whether through a crisis or something that's going on in their life. And you have been placed in that situation prophetically by God to introduce them to Jesus. Now, let me tell you what the number one phobia amongst uh, believers happens to be. You know what it is? Sharing their faith. You know why we have the kind of church we do? It's so that we can pull the trigger for you. You bring them here, we'll introduce them to Jesus, see? And that's the part of it, friends. We are going to be a church to the unchurched. Those people out there that are far away from God, that God says, I want to bring them close to my heart. And that's the reason you have the jobs that you have. Here I am supposed to be Mr. Seeker in Grand Junction. And friends, I have to work, absolutely work, just to meet unchurched people. You're blessed. Not that unchurched people or church people are bad. (laughs) Let me clear that up real quick. But you're blessed because you have the opportunity to engage somebody about their spiritual well-being. Number two is this. We value sound Bible teaching. I have to preach about this one. This is my job, you know. There's a place in the Scriptures that give high priority or values to this form of communication. There are places where dialogue should take place, but this is not the place for it. There's a place where it says in the New Testament in Acts 2 when the church was first formed that they paid attention to the apostles' teaching. But then they went, and I'll talk about this in just a moment, they went from house to house breaking bread and having fellowship with one another and the dialogue that took place there. Now let me tell you why there cannot be a dialogue here with the number of people that are and even the questions that you might have that if you raised your hand and I took time, I'd lose everything that I'm talking about here and I would become greatly frustrated. But when you go house to house and you have a small group, then you can start asking those kind of questions, you see. And so the point of it is, is this. The greatest compliment I get or any of our teaching pastors get about their sermons is not that that was a great sermon. You know what the greatest compliment that I get is? It's like you lived with me all week. And you know I'm not that smart. It means that this. The Word of God, according to Hebrews, is live and active and sharper than to any edged sword. And it pierces our heart, and it just begins to reveal, that's my heart. God's speaking to me. It's alive. And let me just say this to you, friends. In 2006, every one of us need to make a commitment about being under this kind of teaching, this kind of monologue. You know, to understand that God does something here that He doesn't do in the small group. 
There is something that you're going to get from this message tonight or any other message or from whomever that's going to speak it that you won't get anywhere else. And here's what begins to happen to us. Most of the time what happens to people when they get away from God is simply this. They start just not practicing a discipline that God has put in their life. And let me just say this. Church attendance is not a high priority for our society. And when people start, you know, when they end up over some place that they really didn't want to go, usually it starts around one of these disciplines that God has put into your life. And he said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some. That it needs to be. And what happens to us in this arena, and I, I can testify to it, friends. I mean, I listen to messages all the time. And that when that word comes, it just gets really clear all of a sudden. Oh, that's what's going on. Because the Word of God is being active. It's speaking to us. It's coming alive. It's talking to our hearts. Number three is this. We endeavor to remain culturally relevant. We endeavor to remain culturally relevant. I always want a church to be culturally relevant. That our talk, our music, our attire, our buildings, our manner of doing business would relate to people. I believe we can be culturally relevant without giving up the message or the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want our community, friends, to walk in here and feel like they can be a part of it. Now, let me just, let me just, I want to be really sensitive here, but let me just tell you where I'm coming from on this. Um, I think lots of times what happens to churches is people, lots of times, will find themselves... Uh, separated and isolated away from the rest of the culture. And what happens in that kind of arena is that people have a propensity, just like it is individually, that when we separate ourselves from everybody else and we just start having our own kind of thinking, you know what you distinctively become? Weird. (laughs) And that's what happens to the church. Is the church is supposed to be the salt and the light. We're supposed to go amongst the people. We're not supposed to take on their values, but we are to be the salt and the light that leads people away. That's what Jesus did. I mean, he got accused of being friends with sinners, with drinkers, with prostitutes, with all those kind of people. But his life touched him. You know what salt does to a piece of meat six inches from it? Absolutely nothing. It's only good when it touches it. And we are salt. We are light. And here's what I want for this church to be. And this is not to be just on the cutting edge to be on the cutting edge. I don't have any need for that. But I do have a need for this. That when people walk into this place, it's not like they're walking through some kind of a time warp. That we're culturally relevant. And evidently Jesus was able to do that. He talked in a manner that people understood. He related stories that people could understood. He was culturally relevant without obviously giving up the message so that people could have a chance to enter into the kingdom. That's the cutting edge for me, friends. I mean, sometimes I walk into a church and I just, I just see it and I just go, oh God, I couldn't survive here. And I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just honestly telling you, I gotta be culturally relevant because my aim is out there. For those people. Number four is this. See, we're moving along. Y'all happy? Y'all gonna stay with me? Okay, number four. We work hard to provide everyone with a place to serve. We work hard to provide everyone with a place to serve. God has created us with gifts. Now, friends, get a hold of this point. God has created every one of us with spiritual gifts. You have gifts. I have gifts. And those gifts were not given to you for your entertainment. Those gifts were given to you so that you could serve other people. You were built as a serving machine, and if you're not going to serve, you're not going to be fulfilled. You cannot isolate yourself away and try and think that everything that's going to serve you and then be a happy person, it just isn't going to work. Two questions that God's going to ask on the day of judgment, whenever that is. You know, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. I don't think you sit around after you die and go, hmm, I wonder what's going to happen. I think you're going to be fully involved 
And two questions that God's going to ask you is, number one is this, what did you do with my son Jesus? And number two is this, what did you do with the gifts that I gave you? What did you do with them? So now, and there's two reasons, I believe, why God has given to everyone gifts. Number one is this. The reason that God has given you gifts is he knows that the only way that you are going to grow in this life and really have an impact on others is to use them. And then number two is this. One time Jesus, now friends, you think about this, and you think about the impact that we're supposed to have upon our community. And Jesus is looking out with his disciples and he said, guys, look, the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. And here's the point. That in 2006, some of you need to come out of the stands and get into the ball game. And the reason why is, is because people's eternity depend upon how the core of the church grows. And if the core of the church doesn't grow, then that means this. Most of us will be spending our times just with Christians. And as the church begins to grow, as the core of the church, because more and more people become involved with the church, then the church has a greater impact upon the community. Have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule? 20% 20% of the people eat 80%, eat 80% of the food. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. 20% of the people give 80% of the money. And they just find this to be true nowhere, wherever it might be. Friends, I'm, just, I'm, I'm saying this to you, and I hope you hear this. The only satisfaction you're ever going to find in life, the only satisfaction that's really going to last, is when you find a place to serve. And we are so committed to this. We are not going to let you go. We are going to hound you constantly until you find your place. Now, we will not condemn you, but I want you to know we are going to turn up the heat in 2006 until we get everybody functioning in their gift. Number five, we strongly encourage people to participate in small groups. Boy, friends, I cannot overemphasize this one. We strongly encourage people to participate in small group. Now, here's the most important discipline to be practiced this year for everyone in our church to assure everyone is taken care of. Now, let me just talk about this for a minute. You know that God is into explosive church growth? Did you know that? That in two days, the church grew by 8,000 people in the New Testament. I would say that is explosive church growth, wouldn't you? Now, you know what happened after that? Complaints began to come up through the church, and the widows and the orphans were being overlooked. God actually had provided a way for these people to be taken care of. And friends, I cannot say this any more emphatically than this. This is absolutely a pivotal principle that every one of us have to take a a look at. And that is this. God said, you know, first of all, like I said earlier, you pay attention to the apostles' teaching, and then you go from house to house, and you have fellowship with one another. You break bread with people. You pray together. You worship together. You have all the things. And you know what happens in those small groups? And let me just tell you a dynamic that's taking place in our society today, friends. Most people in Grand Junction, Colorado, are lonely. You know why they're lonely? It's because of the high mobility of our society today. They move here and they do not have family or friends and they are looking for relationship. And when you get into relationship and people find that kind of relationship, actually we've had people move away from here and they want to come back for one reason. People will come to church for many different reasons, but they'll stay for one. Relationships. And you get bound into these things. Now, here's where the real dynamic starts taking place. Is that in those small groups, you not only give, but you also receive. And friends, prophetically, let me tell you what happens, and I watch it all the time. People that do not have friends and a crisis that comes into their life, it only sends them into a greater uh, tailspin as far as their life is concerned because they have no one to grab a hold of. 
And when those crises come into your life and people already know you and they're, be, they're ministering to you, you just watch a redemptive lift that begins to take place in the life of people because they already have relationship with one another. Now, let me tell you something. In my opinion, the church has been taught totally backwards of what the scriptures actually say. Most people in churches believe that when there's a crisis that's going on in their life, the per first person they should call is the pastor. And I want you to know that that is biblically unsound. You know what my job is? My job, according to Ephesians 10, 4, 10, and 11, is this. To equip and to train people in the work of the ministry. As a matter of fact, friends, I've watched it. I've watched this very dynamic happen right in front of my eyes. An emergency takes place. And people that are in small groups run up to the hospital and then find out that those people are taken care of. I mean, the dogs, the cats, uh, dinners, uh, children. Not that the children come behind the pets, you know, but you know what I'm talking about? All those things are taking place because people are involved with one another. And if the church is going to go forward, friends, it's going to be because we meet in these small groups. We're going to be disciples in those groups. We're going to love in those groups. We're going to learn how to share our lives with one another. And as we progress through this, then what happens is the church becomes this functional thing that people... Re you know what, what the number one reason that a lot of uh, unchurched people don't come to church? The number one reason why they don't come is because they don't see love. They want to see people practicing what they've been taught. And that happens in small groups. Number six is this. We will continue to strive to practice excellence. We will continue to strive to practice excellence. That means we will be a learning organization. We will never arrive. We're always in process. We want to do our jobs well. We want to be professional. But now notice this, friends. We do not want to be slick. We want to be transparent. But we want to do things right. The reason we want great services, music, children's ministry, youth ministries, nurseries and facilities. There's one reason why we want to do everything with excellence, even down to spelling our words correctly and having as much correct grammar as possible. <laughs> you know who, you're spe uh, who I'm speaking to there. But we want to do everything for, in excellence for one reason. I mean, friends, even outside, when the lawns are mowed. You know, what, did you like the Christmas lights out there? Yeah. You know, when we, when we do things in excellence, it's for one reason. You want to hear what that reason is? So that when people come into this place, God has the opportunity to influence them towards the kingdom. Now, let me just stop and say something here. Uh, all of us that are in business, Practice excellence for the same reason, is we want to influence people towards that product. And in Malachi, God says, you're giving me your leftovers. I don't want your leftovers. I want the best that you got. I want your best time. I want your best resources. I want your best energy. And see, here's the point, friends. God gave us everything in excellence. And he expects his people to give back to him in excellence. Everything that we do just needs to continually get better and better and better so that when people come in here and the Spirit of God touches them, they really have an experience with the Lord because we've done it. We've set the table. We've done it right. Amen? Number seven is this. Wow, I'm really doing good. I should slow up. A structure that allows for people God has gifted with leadership to lead. A structure that allows people God has gifted with leadership to lead. There's, now, pay attention to this, friends. There is no one gift that is more important than the other. I'll try it on this side of the room. There is no one gift that is more important than the other. But I do want you to understand this. And I've been around the church for a long time. I've been in a lot of different churches. I've watched a lot of different churches. And I can tell you this, that those that have, and by the way, it's not just one leader, it's leaders, a bunch of leaders. 
that when a church is being led, well, as a matter of fact, friends, it doesn't even matter if it's in church. It can be in business. It can be in an organization. It can be in a school. It can be in a sports team. It can be anywhere else. That when people have the gift of leadership, it has the ability to take an organization, a church or whatever, to a different level. And God says this. I mean, if you read this in Romans chapter 12, it is quite interesting. God just basically says this about leaders. You know, lead with all diligence. Lead with all diligence. That when a church is led well, things go better. When a church, I mean, by, by people that have the gift of leadership, when a church is pastored with people that have the gift of pastoring, if, if the church is administrated with people that have the gift of administration, you see the wisdom of God that he has placed the gifts amongst the people. You know, here's the, here's the thing, and my secretary is sitting back there, Joni, and what a godsend she is to me. People, I hate details. She eats them up. I didn't know God made people like that. <laughs> didn't know it. You know, and, and it just works so well. As a matter of fact, the very qualifications that makes a great leader are the very qualifications that makes a poor manager. And the very qualifications that great, a great manager are the very qualifications that make a poor leader. And God says this is the gift of leadership and how it comes together. And so we want to have people around it. And I just want to say this with all sincerity. There's some of you here that have the gift of leadership. And the church needs leadership at all levels. And I can't overstate this, friends. I just can't overstate it. If you have the gift of leadership, by all means, for God's sake, lead. Don't sit there. The church needs you. I mean, the game is on. I mean, this is one of the things that just runs in me all the time. And I, you know, I, I hate to use sports analogies, but it's, just, it's like the fourth quarter and we're down by 27 points and we got to win the game. We got to win the game. And some of us just need to be stirred by the Holy Spirit tonight to say, you know, I'm just going to get off the bench. Matter of fact, I'm going to get out of the stands. I'm going to get in the ball game. It's time, people. It's really time. We need leaders at all levels to step up to the pump and lead. Still love me? I'm a pretty insecure guy, you know, number eight. <laughs> Challenge one another to develop. Oh, let me go back. I got time. Just hang on. I want to talk to you just a bit about this whole area about leadership and about women in leadership. Oh, boy. Now, I just I, I want to talk to you about this for a minute, friends. First of all, I understand that in the church there is a great dichotomy over this particular issue, and I understand that. But here's what I want you to hear about this. Number one is this. I, I hope and pray that you would respect me enough to at least believe that I have really studied on this issue and that it is not something that is just culturally in the air and so therefore we're going to have women in ministry. That is not how I do it. Never have done it that way. But I'm going to tell you this. According to Acts chapter 2, God said, I'll pour my spirit out upon all flesh, upon your sons and your daughters, and they will prophesy. And friends, I just want you to know, I've moved past this issue. I've, Cheryl and I have written uh, a statement about how we've come to this conclusion. And if you want to read it, that's fine. But I just want you to hear this. I am not going to relegate 50% of the talents and resources and giftings that God has given to the sidelines because of my point of view, a misunderstanding in the Scriptures. As a matter of fact, Ladies, and I'm not going to ask you to stand, but I am going to ask you to do this. Those that are sitting by ladies, would you put your hand on them? And I just want to pray over you. I just want to pray a prayer of release for you and the giftings that God has for you, that he wants to employ you in this most important work of the kingdom of God. Now, God, I just ask 
a release for my sisters that in your kingdom, they're not some kind of second-rate person, but you call them, Lord, to influence people towards you. Oh, God, release your daughters to the place in your kingdom that you have for them. In Jesus' name. And everyone said. Amen. See, I even prayed before I got to the end. Wow. Number eight. Challenge one another to develop hearts fully devoted to Jesus Christ. Now, worship team, you can come on up. Uh, God says in the Old Testament he was looking for someone whose heart was totally devoted to him. And you know what he found out? There wasn't one. There wasn't one. And he's astonished by that. Now, let's just, let's just use this principle here for a minute. Uh, let's say you've given yourself, you're given your, your heart, 50% of your heart to, to God. Guess what? You're 50% short. Okay, let's step it on up. Let's go on up to 95%. Okay, I've really come across, and I've really given God 95% of my heart. Guess what? You're 5% short. And friends, let me, let me be really honest with you. I don't think that there's a person here that has given themselves or given their heart totally and 100% towards God. You know, there's times where I think that, and then God will just ask me to do the simplest little thing, and I go, no. Do you ever have attitudes like that? You know, and you, you stand up and you talk about this kind of stuff, and you, you really want to do it and all the rest of it, and then, then comes Monday. Saturday and Sunday, you're really on, see, you know. And then comes Monday. Well, I'd like you to do this. It's my day off. It's not... <laughs> Anybody else have that kind of issue that goes on, you know? I'll never forget one time when I walked into a Burger King, one of my favorite places. <laughs> walked, in, walked into a Burger King, and it was my day off. I'm going to read the newspaper and have one of those... Whopper with cheese and all the rest of it, you know. And a guy came up to me that I hadn't seen for 20 years. You know, and my mentality was this. I'm off. And I just felt this little whisper go, oh, ha. Huh. <laughs> we sat down and just had this wonderful conversation together. And friends, here's what I want for 2006 for every one of us. I want to challenge you in 2006 just to give your heart totally to God. You know what I think happens when we do that? I think, I think there are boatloads of blessings in heaven that God wants to pour out on a people that just say, I want to give you everything. I want to develop a heart that just says yes to you. I want you to stand. Friends, here's what we're in need of. This is exactly what we're in need of. We're in need of revival. That the Spirit of God would come and light the fire. That we would come alive again with the passion of God. You know, one of the scriptures that I love the most about the Apostle Paul is he, sa he says this. As you receive the Lord, so walk in Him. And I love to go back to those times when I first met the Lord. And just that, though. Wow, this is the best thing that I have ever experienced in my life. And just to have that, that capture again of God's passion in your heart because you've just totally given him everything. And friends, I want you to know that I can see, talking to a couple of people this last week, um, been reading the prophets. And it's amazing when you look at the prophets. They, uh, they do some wonderful things, but when they're, they're talking, they'll go from the future to the past to the... To the uh, present and then they'll mix it all up and all the rest of it and while i'm reading this i just get a sense god's about ready to do something in our midst i don't know what that is but i know this that god is challenging us give it all give it all don't hold back give it all let's worship the lord